Are you grateful? Are you thankful? It's November, and we celebrate Thanksgiving. I want to put a challenge out to you this morning, if I can. Uh, I was the oldest of seven kids with a single mom, and we grew up, and really most of the time, especially as I was a kid, had very little. We lived in rundown houses that uh, somebody would rent to somebody that had seven kids and a dog that nobody else wanted to live in, and most of the homes I uh, grew up in, as soon as we moved out, got bulldozed down because they wouldn't fit to live in when we were there. But I had one of the greatest blessings in my life that a person can ever have. I had a mom that was just super grateful, super thankful. I never, ever, ever heard her complain about anything. She just always saw the good side, no matter what was going on. She was always grateful. In fact. The thing I remember most about her, she would always say this to us as kids. We didn't appreciate it as much as kids but as I do now, but she'd say, as long as you're alive, you'll get by. As long as you're alive, you'll get by. But I know some of you weren't that blessed. I know because some of you run around and look like you've been sucking on lemons your whole life. I, I have been around families that families are just negative. It doesn't matter what's going on. They just see the, the bottom side of everything. They're just negative all the time. And when you grow up around that, you tend to take on that. The challenge I want to put before you, for the month of November, we'd like to, I say we, because Pastor Todd Lady's coming to preach. Would you come, Pastor Todd? I'm glad you're following Steve, not me, this morning. But we want to challenge you. I told him, I said, you know, we're going to be preaching together this month. I said, let's help people get to the place to where they're thankful, where they're grateful. And then he uh, gave me, a, uh, actually he sent a, a sermon title and outline. And I sat down to put mine together next week, got it all done, sent it out to everybody. And we're preaching the same text. But that's okay. He said, you're going to preach the same thing I am? I said, I'll let you know when you're done this morning. <laughs> Amen. So, uh. Give a new life welcome to Pastor Todd Lady, soon to be our associate pastor. <laughs> good morning. God is so incredibly good. His blessings are enduring and his love is everlasting. We are blessed to be in his presence this morning. I'm blessed to be together with each other. I'll just tell you, his presence has been here. Um, the worship service, that was almost like, don't end it yet. We're just getting started. But God wants to work in the worship service, and he wants to work through the preaching. So we're going to let him do both. Amen? Amen? And so I want to share with you this morning, this is actually, see, we got the tech crew um, confused. Um, this is actually Pastor Ken's next, next Sunday and everything give thanks. <laughs> but it's the same, same scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5. Um, mine is in uh, or the habit of gratitude. So um, I want to share with you about gratitude and how we, it is necessary to make it a habit. That way, when life trips us up, gratitude is what comes out. And it's not all of the other stuff. Like, you know, when you hit your thumb with the hammer, what could come out? That's what I'm talking about. So um, I want to share it with you in that. But then also what I have started to do is on the church Facebook page is every morning I'm sharing a scripture of thanksgiving. Just that daily reminder for those of you who are connected to the church Facebook page of a scripture that has um, something to do with thanks and thanksgiving and gratitude as a daily reminder. So be looking for those little nuggets on a daily basis as well. So stand with me as we share the word of God together and as we partake. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful and continually give thanks to God, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Pray with me. Lord, we are thankful to be able to stand here together with each other in your presence. And Lord, we know that we have come in the name of Jesus, so we have not gathered in this place in vain, for you are with us because we've done that. 
and we're grateful for your presence today. We ask God that as a minister today that your, your spirit would go before the word and that you would work on hearts and that, that we would check, be checked by the Holy Spirit to understand where we lack in gratitude and where we're maybe lacking in thanksgiving. And Lord, that we would, in this month of thanks, that we would change our hearts and that we would allow you to mold us and make us more in your image. And Lord, as you do that, we will become more thankful and we will shine even brighter the light of Jesus to this dark world. We thank you this morning for your presence. We thank you this morning for every person that is here. And we thank you for the working of the word of God. And it is in that mighty name of Jesus we pray and that we give thanks this morning. And God's people say, amen. You may be seated. So in every situation we're instructed in the scripture, in every situation, no matter what the circumstances, to be thankful and continually give thanks to God, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So we're to give thanks to the Lord. That's what the scripture is instructing us to do. You'll notice the key word there is for everything, but not in everything. It's not for everything, but it is in everything. There's a difference there. So we ought to be thankful in every situation because the scriptures told us that. Because of the work that Jesus accomplished at the cross and because of the work that his work at the cross has accomplished in each one of us. We're, we should be thankful. We should be grateful because we are blessed by all that he's done for us before and what he's doing in us and for us even today. So we ought to be thankful, not just because we are told to be thankful, but because we do absolutely have so much to be thankful for. Everyone take a deep breath. If there's nothing else you have to be thankful for today, it's that right there, that breath. Because that breath comes from the breath of God. And it is breathed into us every time we take our breath. And we're given that gift of breath. That is the gift of life in Jesus Christ. That's just the beginning of what we have to be thankful for. And then we can list so many other things. And I know that around tables this month, we will sit and we will, we will list and talk about the things that we're thankful for. But we will find that a lot of those things that we will list are things that can be taken away. Things that might change in the blink of an eye. And then when that happens, what are we left to have thankful for? And where does our heart lie? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. In this scripture, we're not being instructed to give thanks for everything in the world. He said, in everything, give thanks. We don't have to thank God for the storm, but we should thank God in the storm. Thank you, God, for your power. Thank you, God, for your protection. And thank you, God, for your provision. You know that song, I'll Praise You in the Storm? That's what we're talking about. Because even in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the storm, in the middle of a bad doctor's report, we can, we can feel like there's nothing left to be thankful for, but we are still breathing. There is still hope. Jesus is still king, and he's still working on the throne. Who has the final word? The doctor? Not mine. Who has the final word? It is Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So we thank him for his power, for his protection, and for his provision. Thanks, thank, here we go again. Thankfulness is expected of us. There are over 500 occurrences in the Bible where we are admonished and given commandments to give praise and thanks to God. Think about that over 500 times. Some of those 500 times say the same thing. Use the same words or same set of words. But it must have been pretty important for, for it to be squeezed in there over 500 times. And if it's important enough for it to be mentioned that many times in our life, then we should find it important enough to really use these words and, and root them deep in our hearts and then to put them into practice and make it a habit before God to be thankful. 
So we were singing that song, you give and you take away. My heart will choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. There have been times where I've been forced to say, you give and you take away. My mother died, it'll be on November 11th, this week, four years ago since she passed away. We attended church with her that Sunday morning, Veterans Day. And two hours later, we stood beside her bed in the hospital room and she was dead, lifeless. And beside her bed, we stood there and I said, Lord, you give and you take away. Yet that doesn't, I don't stop in this moment praising you, I don't stop loving you, I don't stop serving you. Lord, you give and you take away. My mom's death was ordained before time began, just like her birth was. And I know that yet he gave her to us, and yet she no longer lives. But my heart will choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. He still deserves honor and praise and glory. I'm not going to stop professing his mighty power. I'm not going to stop proclaiming his glory and sharing his mercy just because my mother passed away. That would be stupid. My mother wanted nothing more to be in the presence of God. She didn't expect that that would be the day that she would go, but she went. And yet she's gotten the reward that she so justly wanted. There was a day, there was a morning that we were called to the hospital when Seth was four months old. We were staying the night at a, a Ronald McDonald house, and he had a really rough night. This was after his third major surgery. He was not even six months old. He was around four months old. We walked into the room, and they were, the doctors were scurrying. We, you know, it's, we were called to come, but when you get there and you see a team of doctors and a team of nurses and all of the other staff running in and out of the room, your heart sinks. We didn't realize that the situation was as dire as it was in the moment. But when we get in there, they're talking, and we turn, and we look at Seth, and he's turning blue. There's a nurse that jumps over the, um, the little recliner chair that was sitting there, and she grabs the bag, and she starts putting the bag on his face so that way he can live. Had that um, intervention not happened in that moment, and then he not walked him down the hallway with the bag on his face, he would not have made it. But they wanted us to sign paperwork to... Um, consent to the surgery. We were like, we don't care what you have to do. Just get him there and do it. In the meantime, we're going to stand and we're going to pray, God, you intervene in this situation and you work. God did just that. But when I saw my boy turn blue, and there was part of me that was prepared to stand and say, Lord, you give and you take away. I'm still going to proclaim your goodness and your mercy to people who come into contact. I might have gone through a period of mourning and I might not have been able to justify it or explain it to people. But I know that God has worked in me enough to see that God worked in other people enough. That he's still God, that he rules, and that he reigns. And because of that, my heart has to give him gratitude. I have to be thankful for everything everything. That'll test your faith. Psalms 92, 1 and 2 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. So we're instructed to do it, but then we're told that it is a good thing to do. It is a good practice. I believe that as we put gratitude into practice and it becomes a habit in our lives that our attitude changes, our mindset can change. We will change from looking at things that so doom and gloom and the, the world is going to come to an end and think, you know what, let the world end. Let it perish. It come, comes a new, a new earth and a new heaven and a new reward for us in glory. So we declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. You know, we don't make it through a day without his, without his faithfulness and without his loving kindness. We don't always feel thankful. Circumstances sometimes do get the best of us. Sometimes when the doctor says certain things to us, a moment, anxiety will come over us, fear will, will do the same thing. And when, when we begin to experience all of that, it... it, it it becomes difficult to really pull thanksgiving, thankfulness, and gratitude. It becomes difficult to pull those things out. But David suffered from the same thing. In Psalms 103, beginning in verse 1, it says, Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul. In all that is deep within me, bless 
his holy name. Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. I, when I read this, I see David is almost giving himself a pep talk. We got to remember here, David, Todd, Steve, when we're talking to ourselves, we got to remember what God is, what God has done for us. You know, it might seem impossible right now. It might seem like I can't take one foot and put it in front of the other. It might seem like I can't get out of bed this morning. It says, but I need to tell myself. I need to talk to myself and say, you know who God is and you know what God has done in your life. Now get yourself up. So bless and affectionately praise the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is deep within me, bless his holy name. Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, oh my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. And I think that we need to sometimes remind ourselves of his benefits. What has he done for us? That's why sharing our testimony can be so helpful to not only to other people, but it helps bring us back to that first love. Why did I fall in love with him in the first place? And what did he pull me out of? And, and where could I have been? And, but had it not been for the Lord, I might even be dead. But praise God, here I am. So let, don't forget any of his benefits. Who forgives all of your sin? Who heals all of your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you lavishly with loving kindness and with tender mercy? Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the soaring eagle? The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways of righteousness and justice to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in compassion and loving kindness. I can just pause right there. And I can say to that scripture, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are slow to anger and that you abound in compassion. And thank you, Jesus, for your loving kindness. Because I know there's been times where he's like, I'm done with that one. I, I know that that's not true, but in my mind, if I were God, that's how I would be. And thank God that I'm not and he is and that he, he really is I'm slow to anger. That he abounds in compassion. Thank you of the things that we've said and things that we've done, that sometimes that we maybe have cursed him or lied about God, and yet he is abounding in love and compassion, and his mercy is yet still new for each one of us every single day. He's merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in compassion and loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins as we deserve, nor rewarded us with punishment according to our wickedness. Let's pause again right there and say, thank you, God. Because had he dealt with us according to our sins, Jesus wouldn't have came, and instead of seeking that we would have um, an eternal life with him, we would all face eternal damnation and separation from God. That's how it should have happened. But he decided to step in and he decided to save the day and say there's a better way to do this. So thank you, Jesus, for not dealing with our sin according to what we deserve or giving us the punishment that we deserve. But instead, you came, you lived, you died, and now you're risen again. And Lord, that we have a hope of eternal glory. So what somebody might say about me might not seem so bad when I compare it to the scripture to say that my king is coming again for me, that he loves me regardless of the things that I've said and regardless of the things that I've done. He loves me regardless of the places that I've been. He loves me. He will not deal with me according to what people say about me and the way that people will deal with me. People might write me off, but Jesus is eternal and everlasting and he will not. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is thy loving kindness toward those who fear and worship him with all and filled respect and deepest reverence. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So pause again right there. Thank you, God, that even though I remember the things that I've done, 
Even though I remember the hateful things that I've, I've said and the things that I've done to people and the times that I've cursed your name, God, the moment that I came to you and I cried out and said, Lord, you be my Savior, forgive me of my sins, he cast those things into the sea of forgetfulness not to be remembered anymore. And when the devil comes to tell you that, that Jesus hasn't done the things that you know he's done, you can rebuke him and send him back to hell and say, I am a child of God, forgiven and free this morning. You are, a, he comes to um, blame. That's not the word I'm looking for. Still, that's not what I'm trying to say. He comes to tell us and to, um, to blame us before our people. Accused. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. He comes to accuse us, and he's the accuser of the brethren. He can accuse us until he turns blue in the face. God knows the truth when we stand in him, and that it is his righteousness that we walk in. He's so awesome. I'm confident that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression. When we walk in him, we live in him, we breathe in him, we are thankful for his love, his sacrifice, for the salvation that we find in his blood, and for that hope that we have of eternity with him. But when we know who God is, we begin to show him the attitude of thanksgiving. In Ephesians 5.19, it says, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, offering praise by singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, always, always giving thanks to God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't get a break from this. Not sometimes giving thanks to God when we feel like giving thanks to God, but in all things, in every situation, every single day, to give thanks to God. We can do it through songs and hymns, like this scripture says. And we can do it by speaking with one another and building up in truth the things that God has done for us in thanksgiving. Being thankful when times are tough. It's something that we're supposed to do. Like I said, I'm not naive. I've lived through enough moments in life to know that these are the most difficult moments to give thanks in. To find somewhere deep inside of you and to pull a thanksgiving out in those moments can be difficult. But we have some examples for us in Scripture. We have Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 3. God had brought judgment on the nation of Judah. The Babylonians had come and had wreaked havoc and destruction, and they had been carried off um, carried off the rest of the people into exile. As he looks around, he sees nothing but destruction. But in Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, it says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I'll crawl in a hole and die. I'll complain to everybody I know. No, it's not what it says. It says, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will, get, I will joy in the God of my salvation. He was facing a situation with no crops and, and the devastation from the Babylonians that people very well could have died from starvation and, and all of the rest. But he wasn't going to allow what he saw to be the thing that kept him from giving God glory when God deserved it anyway. And sometimes when we're standing facing the destruction or facing that report or facing what people have said, we get so caught up in ourselves or what we're looking at that we find that it, we can't give God thanks. But if we just change the focus and we look beyond the issue and we look at God, and begin to give him thanks, then we can even go back and start to see where God was working in the middle of the circumstance and that he pulled us through and walked us out of it. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. David in Psalms 57, his life was in danger. 
This was around the time that David fled and was hiding from King Saul in the cave. He said in verse, beginning in verse 1, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take my refuge. Until these calamities have passed by, I will cry out to God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, who are teeth, are spears and arrows, and their tongues are a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit before me. In the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give you praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. He's going to begin the day with praise. I will praise you, O oh Lord, among the people. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. He was in a situation where he was being hunted down and possible destruction would have come his way. I'm sure, there was some fear in his heart. There was the unknown. But he decided that he was right in the middle of all of it. He was going to give God glory. And he said that there was a, there was a pit that was prepared for him, but they had fallen into it. So while he's busy praising God, his enemy falls. So we can give God glory even in this circumstance, and we can be assured he's working it out for us. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above the earth. Even in the dire situation, he gave thanks to God. We can change our focus from him and look at Paul. In Philippians, this is when Paul is in jail for preaching the gospel. And he says in Philippians 1.18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. You see, he was jailed for preaching the gospel. But he said, pretty much I would do it again. And I will continue to praise God even, even if they continue to do this to me. We may not be locked up this morning in a physical prison. But some of us have locked ourselves up and have kept ourselves from giving God glory where he deserves it. And praising God and giving our hearts the thanksgiving to him. And let's break out of those chains and bust open the doors this morning with praise and give God the glory. Paul and Silas did it at midnight. And the prison walls begin to shake, and their chains broke too. And they physically came out of that prison. And we can come out of the prison that we find ourselves shackled in this morning when we are giving God praise and glory in the middle of our, our uh, day. What about us? Can we be like Paul and David and Habakkuk and uh, all of the others in Scripture who praise God? Look at Philippians 4.11. It says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So our gratitude is reflected in our contentment. If we learn to be content in life, it'll be easier for us to give God glory for the things that we have, for the things that we don't have, for the things that have happened for the things that haven't happened, we can give God glory for all of it. You see, some people are moping around about a man that didn't marry him. When had you been married to the person, you would have walked yourself into destruction anyway. So pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and thank God that you didn't marry him and that he didn't want to marry you. You saved yourself a little bit of heartache, a whole lot of trouble. The 
Just let you salivate on that for a minute. But our gratitude is reflected in our contentment. We have to do with um, what he said right here in, in 411. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. Whatever the need he has, whether he wants a lot, needs a lot, or whether he needs little, he's going to be content. And we can choose to be content. We can be, choose to be happy with where we are and then to give God thanks for what we have. For what we have, but for what he's done in our life as well. Philippians 4, 6. Don't be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, in every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. So Paul gives us a couple tips here for contentment. First, be anxious for nothing. Don't fret or have any anxiety it's a whole lot easier said than done, especially from the pulpit. But the moment we put the microphone down and we come down off the platform, we're walking the same path some of you are walking. And, and the enemy will come out and attack us, and anxiety will rise up in us just like it does for you guys. But we're told to be anxious for nothing. So to leave the fret and the anxiety to the side, it's no sweat to say to say it, it just rolls off the tongue sometimes. But when the rubber meets the road, we just have to find ourselves rooted deep in God's word and, and close to him in prayer. And then that's where the, it becomes the habit of gratitude comes out in us, that we can express to him thanks for what I'm going through. Thank you for getting me through it. Thank you for being at the other end of it. It's not fun to go through anything, but knowing that God is walking beside us in the circumstance and meeting us at the other end of it is, is enough to get anyone through anything. So the word anxious or worry means to be pulled in a different direction, to strangle or to choke. It wants to choke the blessings of God out of our life. It wants to pull us in a direction of blessing and peace and joy into a direction of destruction and worry and to fall into a pity party. The devil loves pity parties. He'll go to every one of them. But I can tell you, pity parties are no fun for any of us and we should do our best to stay out of them. There's a Dr. Walter Calvert. He did a study and discovered that only 8% of the things that we worry about are actual legitimate concerns. And they're, all the th they're the things that we, if we were going to worry about, um, we're wasting our time on. So only 8% of the things are actual legitimate. It tells me that there's a whole lot of things that we're worrying about that's just wasting a whole lot of time. And when we're worried, when we're anxious, and we're focused on the problems, well, we forget about being thankful, and we forget about giving God gratitude for all of those things that he's done in our life. The devil wants to distract us. He wants to pull us in the other direction. He wants to strangle and choke out our joy. It tells us to pray to him about everything in every circumstance by prayer and supplication. Some people say, I don't have time to pray. You've never heard that before, have you? Okay. <laughs> they don't have time to pray, but they have time for Facebook and social media. They're woken up at two in the morning posting memes when God's probably telling them, hey, this is your time to pray. They don't have time to pray, but they have time to gossip. They have time for TV. They have time for shopping. They have time to talk on the phone. If we prayed as much as we worried, we would have a whole lot less to worry about. Only one or two of you got it. If we prayed as much as we worried. If we prayed as much as we worried, we would have a whole lot less to worry about. And maybe that's the problem. 
Maybe people enjoy worrying about the problem. Maybe people enjoy the attention the problem brings to them, and they don't want to take it to God, and they don't want to give it to him and let him to work in it and let him resolve it in their lives. It's more fun to take it to Facebook and to say that this is what's going on instead of saying, God, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on my knees and I'm going to cry out before you. I'm, gonna, I'm, not getting, I'm not getting up until you give me an answer. I'm not moving. I'm going to be like the tree that is planted by the water until you speak to me, until you give me direction. I'm not moving. And some of us, we try with a sincere effort. About two minutes in, the phone rings. The kids want something. Notification on our phone pops up. Something for work pops in our mind. And at the same deal, we got to say, I'm not moving. All of those things will wait, but God, I need you. I have a moment before the throne, and I'm going to take advantage of it. So just pray when you want to worry, and you'll find that you have plenty of time for prayer. He says in everything. Not just some things, but in everything. You can pray about it. Some people think that God only cares about the big things, the religious things. God cares about how many. They think that God only cares about the people that we talk to about Christ or the people that we invite to church or that he only cares about how much we give. God cares about so much more. You know what? God cares about your car payments. And when you have a need to get it, get, have that payment made, he will provide. We present the need to him in prayer and supplication. We make it known before him. And we say, God, this is an opportunity for you to make a way where there is no way. He is faithful and he is true. He shows up. But then we have to, with the heart of gratitude, give him all of the thanks that he is due. Because he deserves it. He's interested in your job. He's interested in your headache. He's interested in every other detail of your life. There is nothing you cannot pray about. If it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about. There is nothing insignificant to God. So again, we talk about prayer and supplication, but what is that? It's the action of asking or begging for something earnestly and humbly. With thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Trusting in him and constant in prayer. He leads us. And then our hearts are filled with gratitude. When we rely on him and he comes through the way he does every single time, the habit just increases. It well, the thanksgiving wells up in it, and then it doesn't have to be something you have to practice or make yourself do. You just begin to walk around and, uh, with an attitude of, Gratitude, thanking God for everything, whether it's the leaves that are changing on the trees to the birds that are singing to the grass that's green, whether it's the sky that's blue or the the rain that's falling, the thunderstorms, or whether, you know, you got stopped at a stop sign and there was an accident a couple feet in front of you. You begin to give God thanks in all of those things. And whether we have a lot or a little. The amount that we own, what we possess, will have little to do with how grateful we are. Because gratitude will arise out of a relationship with God, not out of a relationship with things. Whether we have, I'm down the next bullet point. In the end, gratitude doesn't arise out of what we've been given But out of that relationship, everything that we have can be taken away from us. Those that we love, the homes that we live in, the things that we possess inside of those homes, the cars that we drive, our homes, all of those things can be stripped away from us. And sometimes that happens to us, and it happens oftentimes in a very, like a blink of an eye. Think about a family whose home catches on fire 
or a family who, who dies in a car accident, their lives are utterly changed in just a, a, a moment. Yet even people who go through those things can thank God in those things for the breath that they have and that God has kept them, that God is making a way for them, that he's provided salvation for them. We don't have to look at everything that happens to us as doomsday, the end of the world or the end of our life. But God, what are you doing in this? What are you showing me through this? And we begin to teach our hearts to be grateful through it. And we watch God work it out, and it just becomes incredible what he's able to do through those situations. Our Father God cares for us. He loves us so much that he was willing to send his son and sacrifice to the cross, the cruelest death known by man. He was willing to do that for us. And so we tend to sometimes feel separated from him and, and then kind of not feel because so much time has passed and the lives that we live and the things that we go through that he can't care about the small things. It's so far from the truth. If he loved us enough to give his son for us, he cares about everything. Will the worship team go ahead and come forward? As I read Colossians 3.17, it says, Whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and dependence on him. We hear this scripture a lot, and everything you do, do it as though you're doing it to the Lord. And then people will mumble and complain that they have to do it. And they'll do a good job at it, but they're mumbling in the process. We have to read the rest of the scripture too, where it says giving thanks to God for the Father through him. We don't have to like every task that we get, but we should even get to thank God we get to do it. Especially at work, there are people who want jobs. There are people who would, who would like to work even, but physically they're not able. And yet we complain about getting up and having to clock in and listen to the man and all of those things. But God, thank you that we are privileged that you provided for us a way to earn a living and a method and a means and for my talents that you've given me. Making gratitude a habit begins with trusting God and keeping in constant prayer and learning to be content. I'm going to end with Hebrews 13, 15, where it says, Through him, therefore let us at all times offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of lips that thankfully acknowledge and confess and glorify his name. So at all times, at all times, in everything, for everything. You know, we have a few moments left in this service together. We're going to have a moment of worship, a moment of praise. This is a beautiful time designed to give you an opportunity to lift your hearts up, to lift your voices up and to use the instruments God gave you to give him glory and to show your hearts of gratitude. We don't know that we get another opportunity to come together and do the same thing next Sunday morning. Jesus could come before then. You serious? I'm serious. God could come back. Amen. And Lord, come quickly. Amen. We don't know. There might be, and I said this exact same thing the Sunday morning from the pulpit that my mother died. I said, I don't know. What, there, we don't know which one of us may not be here next Sunday. That's it. I might not have said it that morning knowing that it was going to be my own mom. But the, the reality is there might be somebody that's not here next Sunday morning because they've been called by the way of the grave. Don't allow your moments that are fleeting to go by without giving God the glory and the thanks that he's due. 
If he never does another thing for any one of us, he's already accomplished salvation through the sacrifice of his son at Calvary. And we're going into a season where we're going to be seeing a whole lot of I want, I need, I give me. So before we get there, let's change our attitude. Let's change our hearts to be thankful for what we have and in what we've been through. And maybe we won't want or need so much next month because we've already found our peace and our joy and everything else into the gift of the world in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to say a quick prayer before I turn it over to the worship team. So go ahead and stand with me. Lord, we thank you again for this service, God. Thank you for speaking to even me through this message that even though I've had moments that I've been really good at being grateful, that I've had a lot more moments where gratitude has been the last thing on my mind. And Lord, for your reminder in your word that we need to be thankful, Father God, not for all of the things that we go through, but in the things that we go through, because regardless of it, you're in it with us, you'll see us through it, and that you will provide for us through your power and your protection. Lord, I just pray that and I know that I'm not the only person who, who has moments where gratitude is, is not something I'm good at. I pray that this word falls on good ears, Lord, that we would hear from you, the spirit of God, and that we would be encouraged by the 500 times that we're told in the scripture to be thankful, to show an attitude of gratitude, to make it a habit in our lives. So speak those words to us. Help them to come to our mind and our memory. And Lord God, that we would seek out thanksgiving to you before we would start complaining to the world. We want our lights to shine as bright as they possibly can and to point as many people to Christ. And we know that a grateful heart is a way to do that. Help us, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He's going to be my associate pastor. I'm going to have to up my game. Amen. You know, if Jesus never did another single thing, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, if he never did another single thing for any of us than what he's already done in going to the cross, we would still have everything to be thankful for every day. <laughs> 